Hello everyone, this is Bob Brown with Community Coronavirus Update number 45. Today we'll talk about uh, what we're calling the Great Barrington debacle. Nebraska needs a clear plan and some comments on testing. Uh, and so this uh, libertarian think tank produced a, a plan called the Break Great Barrington Declaration. Uh, public health folks are looking at this and saying uh, uh, this is wrong, essentially. Uh, and so depending on where you believe you take your expertise from, and I like the public health on call and uh, Michael Osterholm's uh, SIDRAP updates in University of Minnesota, both uh, took time out last week in their updates to say why this is such a bad idea. Uh, and Ali Khan also had an uh, uh, update this week with uh, hosted by Senator Tony Vargas, also telling about this uh, plan being uh, essentially kind of wishful thinking and based on uh, no real evidence that it actually works. Uh, and so the Great Barrington debacle is put together by a libertarian think tank that thinks we that just basically need to let coronavirus run its course to save the economy. Uh, there are some things in it that make sense. However, the overall plan does not make sense and is not based on firm science. Uh, the four things that I see wrong with it, uh, a couple things. So first is that it's unlikely, it's based on this unlikely theory of natural herd immunity, uh, which actually has not, never been tried out before and, and we know from history doesn't work. So a little history lesson. Uh, so this is a, a life expectancy in England and Wales going all the way back to 1700. You'll see that for a lot of history, uh, basically people lived to had an average life expectancy around 35 to 40. Uh, and so that was the norm through most of human history. Uh, what got better was public health interventions, things like clean water, sanitation, vaccination. That's why our, our life expectancy has grown dramatically in the last 150 years. You'll see a couple big dips here. This is actually World War I, followed by the, the influenza epidemic of 1718. That's how big a spike that was. It was actually worse than World War I. This littler spike is actually World War II. So infections play a huge role in life expectancy. And what happened through most of history is that never, they never reached a steady state herd immunity. You would have outbreaks of disease over and over and over again. People didn't reach herd immunity to things like smallpox or diphtheria or typhoid. They just kept spreading. And so this natural herd immunity thing doesn't really work and hasn't actually panned out ever in history. Um, some examples 150 years ago, this is actually a Nebraska history, it's my history. So my great-grandparent, great-great-grandparents Otto and Daniel Runquist uh, settled uh, between Chapel and Oshkosh. They had six children, three died, and you look, see, three of them died, two died from diphtheria, one died from typhoid. Uh, we all uh, received diphtheria vaccinations in infancy now, so we never see diphtheria anymore. Uh, typhoid's a little bit different story. Another famous Willie who died of uh, typhoid was actually Abraham Lincoln's son living in the White House. So if you watch Lincoln uh, when it came out, uh, there's some scenes where Mary Todd Lincoln is distraught about her son Robert uh, joining the army. And the reason she was so distraught is, wasn't just because she was worried about him. She'd already experienced uh, the death of, of, of her uh, uh, son Willie in the White House probably from contaminated water in the Potomac because the Union Army was camped upstream. And so typhoid uh, killed a lot of people. We, we never hear about that anymore. Why don't we hear about it? Because it's been stopped. It's been basically eliminated from uh, most environments. Uh, basically, we did it with clean water, sanitation, and hand washing is the main reason. Basically, non-pharmaceutical interventions, just like we've been talking about with coronavirus. Also, there's some quarantine isolation that was done, uh, the famous case of typhoid Mary, uh, because she, she was a carrier and spread it to lots of folks. Uh, and then if, if needed, there are antibiotics and vaccines, but we rarely need them because we've limited it just with the non-pharmaceutical interventions alone. Uh, however, if you do travel to Central America, and I did a while back, and I did get a vaccine for typhoid because in Central America, some places, they don't have the clean water and sanitation and typhoid still does spread. The Japanese are the masters of non pharmaceutical conventions for coronavirus, and so essentially they have con uh, controlled their virus just with the non or mostly with the non pharmaceutical interventions. Uh, almost everybody wears a mask, and they they are the ones who pioneered the three Cs: C's, closed spaces, avoid crowded places, and avoid co contact settings. That, with some good contract tracing, has made Japan one of the best countries in the world in their response to coronavirus. So if you look at their numbers, their numbers speak for themselves. There's this line way down in the bottom. That's Japanese cases being spread. Here's the United Kingdom, here's the United States, the European Union, which is now taking out of control, going out of control, France, uh, one of the worst countries now again. Uh, and so Japan uh, has basically proven that this works, uh, as has uh, multiple other countries. Uh, if, if the United States had had the same response that Japan had, we'd have only had 4,300 deaths instead of the over 200,000 deaths we've already had. Uh, a new headline came out that actually says this is probably an underestimate. It's actually probably more like 300,000 that's so far when you look at excess deaths. So that's the difference between how we've done and how the Japanese have done. 
The other thing that uh, the Great Barrington debate uh, gets wrong is the public health goal is to avoid lockdowns, not to make lockdowns. And so they have this straw uh, man argument where they say, if we do public health interventions, we all have to lock down. And actually, the only thing that might get us to lock down again is if too many people follow this Great Barrington uh, debacle and start uh, ignoring things like masks and letting it spread through the community. So. If you've listened to my pod, these uh, YouTube updates for the whole time, I've been advocating that we not lock down and that we not stay at home. And so one of the reasons, of course, is we can find safe things to do. So this is me at the barber shop getting my haircut. If long as you're wearing masks, you're fine. So get out there. Uh, we talked about going out to social events as long as you've got space and distancing. I think travel is fine. I just got back from a road trip with my dad. We went out to Utah. Uh, here's uh, us at Bryce Canyon and... Uh, horseback riding in Red Canyon. Uh, the biggest challenge, of course, is finding an outside place to eat. But if you find an outside place to eat, it's pretty safe. And so I, we thought that this was just fine. And so I don't think we need to lock down or stay at home. Uh, the big problem coming this winter is, is it's going to be a little colder outside. So we actually did get the little heater in the back patio so that we can eat outside more, uh, even though when it's a little colder. Uh, the other thing is that we've, we've shown that basically schools do not seem to be scooper spreaders. They were back before we were having uh, kids wear masks at school, so there were uh, well-documented uh, super spreading outfits, out, uh, out uh, breaks in Israeli schools. Uh, however, the U.S. schools are not showing this as long as they were using masks. There were some outbreaks in, in Georgia uh, when kids were coming to school without masks, but when we have kids in schools with masks, with the interventions in place, we are not seeing any super spreading events so far uh, within schools across the country. So we can get out there in a, ma a, ma a safe environment. The problem the thing is we just have to use the precautions, uh, basically using uh, mostly masking uh, with supplementing with other things like spacing, cleaning, hand washing, things like that. The other thing is, that is wrong about the Great Barrington debacle is that there's no feasible way to isolate what they call low risk and, and high risk, and there's not a smooth demarcation between low risk and high risk anyway. And so this doesn't work, partly because there are so many high risk people. You, it's really, you can't just take half of Lincoln and put them in one bucket and the other half go live over, over someplace else and isolate them. That doesn't work. If you look at the deaths in Nebraska, uh, basically a lot of these deaths, it's not just old people in nursing home. There's a lot of people in their 50s, 60s, even 40s that are dying. And so one of the high risk conditions is obesity, which is about a third of Nebraska, just to, that alone. So you can't really separate the high risk and low risk like they're proposing. The other thing is the death toll. And so most experts would say the death toll is going to be somewhere between 500,000 and a million if we pursue this. Uh, 500,000, uh, I think, was quoted on the Johns Hopkins. Of, uh, Ali Khan thinks closer to a million. I think it's closer to a million as well. And so the worst thing we could do right now is to follow this Great Barrington debacle. And I think part of the problem is I think there are some uh, believers in this, and they're mostly here in, in, in rural middle America. I think there's some governors who seem to be able to be leaving this, and that's probably part of what, what is leading to this huge spread within uh, rural America and the heartland. Uh, all state after state has turned red uh, with rates way, way below above where we would want them to be. In Nebraska, unfortunately, well, we're up to the top five. We passed Utah, which did actually put in a mask um, ordinance in place. So their Republican governor did change his mind. It's time for ours to do the same. Uh, we do not want to keep getting f f uh, farther and farther up here where these hospitals are already at capacity. So and another example is that it's not just Japan that's done really well. A great example is Maine and uh, Dr. Narav Shah. And so here we have a credible public health expert leading a state effort. And state uh, Maine has one of the best uh, results of any state in the United States so far. Uh, they followed basically the, the, the sort of the pandemic response playbook, which is have a credible health public health expert deliver the message, not the politician. Uh, we're in a hyper-partisan environment right now. And so if a Republican carries the message to half the Democrats, the other half that are Democrat don't don't believe them and if the Democrat carries the message that they have the Republican don't believe that person so so what we really need is a nonpartisan trusted public health person leaving that leading this effort so if Nebraska were doing this we'd have somebody like uh, Dr. Ali Khan or James Lawler carrying the message because people will trust a, tr a public health professional in the way that they don't trust a politician the other thing is it has to be a very clear and consistent and repeated message and so he does uh, basically twice a week press conferences or regular messages uh, with very clear asks if you look at Maine, uh, Maine is actually one of the safest states in the country right now, uh, and their results also speak for themselves. So this is Maine way down here. Nebraska kind of uh, unfortunately catching up to, to some of the other states. Hopefully we don't catch up to Wisconsin and Montana. We do need a response, and we need to be able, uh, very decisive about this in the near future. So... Uh, a few weeks ago, we created a public health district map of Nebraska. It now is useless, essentially, because the entire, every public health district in Nebraska is now red. So nobody's do, really doing a good job right now, unfortunately. 
Um, the big thing I have worried about right, right now is I think we are going to start hitting hospital capacity issues. Our pre previous high record was three, 232, followed about three weeks after this peak uh, of, uh, of cases. And what people are not looking at is it takes three weeks for this peak to hit. So the, the hospitalization rate we're seeing right now, 380, it's based on the number of cases we had three weeks ago, not the current high level of cases that we're seeing right now. And so if you look at where we are right now uh, with cases way up here and project forward, uh, where we are at 380 hospitalizations, this would actually project, if we have the same increase, 711 hospitalizations and still rising, unfortunately. So we have, uh, are really worried that we're going to start burning out our nursing staff uh, if we don't slow things down in the near future. Uh, another way to project forward, which would be more accurate, you can take this right off of the Nebraska website. Essentially what they do, if you break down by age group, the number of identified cases, the, what percentage of those cases that led into the hospital, and what percentage died, for all every hundred uh, of new cases in the 55 to 64 age group, you can predict roughly eight hospitalizations and one death. So we can predict in advance what our hospitalization rate is and what our death rate is likely to be based on the numbers we already have in Nebraska. And this is all reproducible just by going to the state website. So we need to start looking at this data and being more proactive instead of reactive. We don't want to wait till people are dead or in the hospital getting told of this. We need to start work following identifying cases and get our numbers down as soon as possible. Uh, the one sh sign of hope is that the good state does seem to me now be talking again uh, with Dr. James Lawler and Ali Khan. Uh, Dr. James Lawler was on uh, the news conference last week, and so we need some tre uh, credible, trusted public health experts with the right background. Uh, I think we'll have a real plan when I see Dr. Governor Ricketts standing next to both James Lawler and Ali Khan, both carrying uh, the message that he's putting out there, instead of the political and partisan me message that's out there right now. So. Uh, we do know what, what the spread is happening. We do know that some there are some super spreader events, uh, basically Eagles Club dances, fraternity parties, uh, weddings more recently. Uh, but there are also we also know most of the spread is also coming from small social gatherings. It's just people just not doing the right thing at home, having the video game a thumb in the basement, uh, guys having a beer after a golf scramble, the multiple family birthday parties. Uh, these are just not safe things to do. What happens is that those inevitably spread over to the older members of the family, uh, and that's where we're seeing a lot of our older people are getting sick in hospitals, not because of what they did with those high risk, it's because they were around younger relatives who were, no, were not uh, being uh, safe. So the governor did release uh, some new directed health measures. Unfortunately, I do not think these are very clear or consistent. And so, for example, he starts with the three C's that Japanese use, avoiding consigned spaces, crowded spaces, but then actually it goes on to say that actually those crowded spaces can exist. A maximum of eight individuals in a party uh, does not help, does not do enough to slow a spread. Um, not, First of all, if they are not wearing masks, all eight can get infected by one person at that table. In addition, are those tables also split more than six feet apart so that it doesn't spread to the other tables as well? And of course, we all know that weddings and funerals, people mix about, they mill about, they talk to each other. So unless there are masks with all of these environments, you're going to get spread. And so this is not enough. Uh, we do need to make sure that people are wearing masks. And other things like bars and restaurants, as I see when I go into them, I do not go in for very long because when I look around, almost nobody's wearing a mask. People are basically using that exception as an excuse not to wear a mask. So they grab their cup of coffee, sit down, take their mask and leave it off. And that does not work. And this will not stop the spread of coronavirus. So dream gyms or directed health measures need to be more explicit about masks. While we are in the bar, restaurant, coffee shop, wedding or church, you need to still have a mask on. Um, and Dr. Uh, uh, Ali Khan had a good point too, that in the past Fauci has said that the virus decide, and actually no, the virus doesn't decide anything. It has no brains basically, and it doesn't even move. We have to decide to move the virus. And so it's up to us to make a difference. We decide whether the virus spreads by our own behavior. The virus doesn't do it it's on its own. Uh, Dr. Khan has actually show, uh, basically project, put out this eight-week plan. Again, this is a hard problem because our test turnaround, which is the first one of the first steps, it's hard to have test turnaround to contact tracing when tests are still taking four days to get back. So unfortunately, we still have four days uh, turnaround time in Test Nebraska, which won't make this work. Uh, so again, the new guidelines, everyone should wear a mask at least six feet apart. Um, a few comments on rapid testing. I won't go into this because unfortunately it's just too complicated for a short YouTube. Uh, the test is, uh, which test is used is complicated by its sensitivity and specificity. And what question are you trying to ask when you order it? Is this a high risk exposure, a symptom or surveillance screening? Uh, so the most important thing when you for rapid testing is that you have a healthcare provider order it. Uh, who, who understands it. Uh, the other thing is, is uh, 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 people sometimes talk about antibody testing. Uh, there's a presentation that Dr. James Lawler gave to the County Medical Society. I put a link to that in the notes section as well. Essentially, antibody testing is not ready for prime time. Unless you're an epidemiologist, you probably shouldn't be ordering it. 
Uh, again, remember that you cannot test your way out of quarantine. So just because you have a negative test here doesn't mean that you're not you're uh, free of quarantine. Uh, also, there is no need to do a test once you've finished your isolation time or quarantine. You don't need a negative test. So some employers are asking for a negative test. Uh, no, follow the, the day guidelines. Follow what your contact tracer and your healthcare professional says. Uh, the fact that there is no need to test your, well, frankly, you can't test your way out of quarantine. And once you finish your time, you don't need to be tested again. So lastly, basically, uh, what can you do as an individual? Well, avoid the herd. Uh, wear a mask, keep your distance, use the three C's, outside is better than in, and wash your hands. So hopefully this is helpful to you. Uh, past videos are at healthylincoln.org, and of course the disclaimer that these are my opinions, which uh, line up most with these organizations, but 100, not 100%.